And now I have wonderful honor of welcoming Connie Carpenter Finney to the stage. Many of you know Connie from her work with our uh, with the Davis Finney Foundation. For those of you who don't know Connie, Connie is an entrepreneur, an artist, an author, a lifelong athlete, and she's also chair of the board of directors of the Davis Finney Foundation. She's got her master's degree in exercise science, and uh, she has had well over 20 years of experience as a care partner. Today, she is going to be doing a presentation on lessons she's learned. Connie, take it away. Thank you, Polly. Appreciate being here. Um, and I just wanna, let's start. Uh, I, know, I also appreciate everyone who's sticking around. Uh, I know it's not easy, especially if you're somewhere where the weather's really nice, but I promise to tell you a good story. So stay with me here. Uh, but before we get started, let's just kind of digest everything that you've learned this morning. We've had some great chats uh, from Amber and Jessica and all of our other caregivers that, you know, just have such a wide uh, range of knowledge. Uh, you know, we're not professionals, uh, but we talk like we are, right? <laughs> this is something that we thought we'd be getting our PhD in, uh, in being care partners, but here we are. So let's take a minute, everyone, just kind of be here together. Maybe drop your shoulders a little. Close your eyes for a second. And let's just take a few breaths together while we're in this space worrying about our person with Parkinson's and wondering how we are going to take care, how on earth we are going to take care of ourselves. <laughs> Just let that thought in and let that thought out. And maybe let's start this conversation with the notion that we're all doing our best. I want to set that intention right at the top for you to think about how good you are at this job, and it can be a job of being a care partner. And thank you for showing up today. Let's go ahead and open your eyes. Feel better? <laughs> I hope so. Um, I'm going to also show you a little um, PowerPoint today, so we can go ahead and put that up. And, um, you know, I, when Polly asked me um, if I would do this talk, I said, yeah, but um, I know way too much to condense it to, you know, 40 minutes. And I also feel like um, many of you have heard me talk before. And so to be honest with you, first of all, I'm still learning lessons. So this isn't uh, the final chapter by any means. And you know what else? It's also um, it's also appropriate, if you don't mind, I'm going to um, give a shout out to Susan Imke. She was actually supposed to give this talk um, and I wish she was here today. And she had a fall and had some health problems and her husband also had Parkinson's and she lost him earlier this year. So Susan, this one's for you. Um, she has been a longtime speaker at our Victory Summits and is really a wonderful resource. So I'm trying to channel some of you, Susan, as, I, um, as we go into this. So again, first of all, thanks everyone for showing up. I don't usually lead with the fact that um, I won the Olympics almost 40 years ago in Los Angeles for my sport cycling. But I thought I'd tell a little story from that today. It's a little something I, I don't usually share with the Parkinson's care partner community. But I think it's important because it'll teach you a little bit about me, might give you a little um, inspiration and also a lot of food for thought. So uh, on July 29th, 1984, I won the Olympics by 
uh, a 50 mile road race. And I like to say I won the Olympics because, wow, it sounds like I won everything. <laughs> Not. I won the first race on the first day of competition in Los Angeles. And it was the first time women's cycling had been included in the Olympics. Um, so let's go ahead and show the first slide. I want to show you uh, how close it was. Um, I am sprinting to the finish line, a pack of six. There were easily half a million people lining a 10 mile course. We had um, five, the women did five laps, the men did um, 11 or 12. I don't know, Davis is in the other room, so he would be correcting me about now. Um, but the point is we all raced in this beautiful uh, venue in Mission Viejo with all of these screaming crazy people. And I beat my teammate to the line, which you can barely see at the bottom of this picture by an inch. Um, so I could talk to you, uh, you know, and I do talk to a lot of groups about what it takes to be an Olympian, but that's not what I'm really going to talk to you about here. I'm going to talk to you about what an Olympian is thinking about when she wins the race. So the first thing I did was cross the finish line with my arms in the air. I knew I'd won, even though it was close. And I really didn't know it was that close until the next day when I saw it on, uh, I think I was on Good Morning America or something. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that was close. And, uh, and so Davis was right after the finish line. I was able to give him a big hug. We were married at the time. And the big story was, could the, the, you know, the married couple both medal or both win on the same day? And the media had, of course, decided that we could. Uh, the odds were really stacked against us. Um, no American had won um, the Olympic road race <laughs> uh, in, in, in any Olympic uh, history. So we were... Um, basically, uh, you know, kind of between a rock and a hard place. And I'm sorry, Davis, that you had so much pressure because <laughs> I got to get mine out of the way. I, I raced first, he raced after me. And then um, he was right there at the finish line and he had been trying to watch on a tiny little black and white TV or something that was over in the secure team area. And he actually couldn't tell at the moment had I won. And I, you know, literally fell off my bike in his arms saying, I think I won. <laughs> and so that's the first thing I did. The second thing I did um, after kind of collecting myself, maybe I combed my hair, I was a little sweaty. Maybe I sponged the sweat off. To be honest, I think I changed into a dry um, stars and stripes suit for the medal ceremony, but the medal ceremony wouldn't be for uh, about half an hour after the race. And, and it was scheduled kind of in, a, in that secure area. So I couldn't see any of my family or friends who had come to the race. My brothers, um, some really good friends and um, Davis's parents were there, but my parents stayed home. And I was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. And my, um, my mom, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when she was 30 and I was five. So I don't have a recollection of my mother to, without, you know, without MS. MS is also a neurological disease. It can be very debilitating. It's, it's different from Parkinson's in, in many ways and it's actually much better, um, there's much better treatment for it now, but in my mother's day, um, basically she put it on the, um, tried to put it as best she could um, on the back burner and not talk about it too much. Uh, we're different now, you know, she didn't have these kind of resources. And part of the reason we started the foundation was that so many, um, so many foundations are, you know, cure-based looking for the cure, we want the cure, but I heard throughout my lifetime that a cure for MS was around the corner. And uh, while treatment is much, much better, uh, there is still no cure. And so, you know, a big part of why we started, we started this foundation was, you know, Davis was 40 when he was diagnosed and we knew this would be a very long journey. Uh, we didn't really know how unpredictable it would be. And I think that's the thing that we all know now. Um, many of you listening today ha are, have been living with, your person with Parkinson's for 10, 20 years. Those of you that are signing on new, um, good for you to have this resource and, um, and other care partners that 
uh, are sharing such important uh, information. So, so that's um, so we feel lucky and blessed that we've been able to start this foundation and uh, work together. We rode our bikes together, and now we we work on supporting the foundation together. But in that moment, when I finished the road race, and I was in fact Olympic champion, which um, in all of my career, I had been very successful, but I had never imagined, um, fully imagined that moment and what it would feel like and what I would want to do next. And um, let's go ahead and show the next slide because I want to let you know that what I wanted to do was phone home. <laughs> and this was actually in the time before cell phones. Actually, some people had big clunky cell phones, you know, that would, uh, uh, pretty silly, but I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have any communication um, after I finished the race and I wanted to phone home um, and, and talk to my parents. So I got on um, a little frantic search for a telephone. And I was assigned as I finished, there was a little volunteer that was sort of my shadow and to make sure I got to the uh, medal ceremony when I was supposed to be there. And I said, do you know where I can find a phone? <laughs> you know, we were in the middle of a residential neighborhood, so there, there weren't any pay phones. <laughs> I didn't have a quarter anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but I started uh, searching for a phone. And, uh, and it's kind of, I, I've written about it, and I'm going to just read a little bit to you because I want to keep it straight. But uh, it is ironic today when, you know, we can't put our phones down, that that's the first thing I did was go look for a phone. So when I asked my turquoise clad volunteer escort, phone? Telephone? She just shook her head. There has to be a phone, I thought. Phone, I mimicked phone. I looked around. I looked at the coaches. I looked at the other volunteers, the course marshals. Phone? <laughs> Everybody just shrugged. They also might have congratulated me, but I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in finding a landline to call home. So what I did was I um, started walking toward um, some scaffolding that was right at the finish line. And it had some big, it was the Olympics were televised, televised by ABC that year. And so big big signage, lots of cables coming out of this sca rickety scaffolding. And I was like, I'm going to go ask those guys in the announcing booth if they have a phone, because <laughs> I knew they would be on a break. Our race was finished and the men's race hadn't started yet. So I climbed up into the, the scaffolding and there was Al Michaels, who's a very famous uh, football announcer, actually, um, and Greg Lamont, who has won the Tour de France, and Eric Hyden, who grew up in my neighborhood. Uh, and as you maybe recall won five gold medals in 1980 for speed skating, which was also my first sport. So um, I knew two out of the three guys pretty well. And I kind of sheepishly poked my head up into the, into the scaffolding and I said, where they were sitting and I said, hey, can I use your phone? <laughs> and they, uh, they were surprised to see me. They all congratulated me and, uh, and patted me on the back and pointed over in the corner to where the phone was. And so I said, uh, yeah, I'll chat later. I really need to call my parents. So <laughs> they, they stayed home because it would have been too hard for my mom. And we never envisioned there'd be so many people there at the race course, but it would have been too hard for my mom to watch and move and be there. So this was the first time women's cycling was on television. And it was the first time and the last time my parents would see me race on TV because I actually stopped racing right after that race, in fact. Um, so I grab, you know, I sit down, my legs are trembling. I'm really <laughs> thirsty, <laughs> but I start dialing. Six, oh, eight, two, four, nine, five, eight, two, two my home phone number. And it starts ringing. Oh, good. They're not on the phone. I thought maybe they'd be on the phone. Then it'd be busy. We didn't even have call waiting at that point. So the phone rang and rang and rang. And I'm starting to think the worst, like they forgot. My dad had a heart attack. 
uh, <laughs> you know, what's going on? And I just let the phone ring and I was holding the, you know, the ringing phone up to my ear and I was just like rolling my eyes, like, come on parents. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, all of a sudden, just as I thought they'd forgotten, my mother answers the phone, winded, out of breath. And I have to tell you, I've never, ever, ever seen or heard my mother out of breath. And so, you know, she just didn't move fast enough with Parkinson's. She had a, a, a wobbly gait, shall we say, oh, with MS, sorry. Uh, she had a wobbly gait, and I think you can all uh, relate to that not being quite as fast and uh, she you know she was a pretty young woman then but uh she was early 50s i'm calling that young and um when she got on the phone and my first words to to her as my dad also chimed in on the other line were mom geez where were you <laughs> and i just love that memory because now that i've had my own children i can appreciate um you know, me just kind of, you know, not just giving them the breath to say, you know, well done. <laughs> and instead, uh, I'm like, at least you answered the phone. And they said, yeah, 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 we're great. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I let my dad talk, you know, you did it. It was so fun to watch you on TV. How are you? All of these questions. And, um, then I just was like, but, but where were you? Why did the phone ring so many times? <laughs> and my mother answered, oh, dear. We were out in the backyard shooting off bottle rockets. <laughs> and, you know, these, this was my mom and my dad. My mom in full flight with her disease. My dad as the most wonderful care partner. And they were making the most, uh, the sweetest lemonade from the lemons that they had been delivered. Um, and that's what my mother always said. I could always feel her smiling through the phone. She had such an upbeat, positive attitude. And it's something that, you know, I've been able to embrace throughout my life and especially in this journey with Parkinson's. And so, you know, I always tell people, what did it feel like to win the Olympics? And, you know, in a, in a big way, it was relief. But in, in the other way, it was this deep feeling of joy um, and, a, and, a, a, and a time and a capacity to connect over time, actually, with all the people who had supported me in such wondrous ways. And so my first instinct was to connect. And connection is such a big part of living during this time of pandemic and also living with someone with Parkinson's. And so I would ask you just to sort of sit for a second with that crazy little story and think about your team, your connections, and who's important to you. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge how many people lift us up and carry us. And if you feel cut off from family and friends because you don't live in close proximity, there's always the phone and better than that, FaceTime. And there's also new friends. We've found that many of our new friends are actually better at supporting us than our friends that we knew when we were racing. And that's because um, they've really only known Davis when he's had Parkinson's and he's had it now for 20 plus years. Um, team is important. Team is number one, I think really. Um, let's go ahead and uh, pull up the next slide. So um, that's what joy looks like. <laughs> but I was so far from all the spectators, I couldn't see any of my family members that were there. And, and so in a, in a lot of ways, all I really wanted to do is get off that podium and go, you know, throw myself at the crowd <laughs> and find my family who I wouldn't see until much later. So that's my Olympic experience. And because of that, let's go to the next slide. Because of that, I, my tips to you all may be a little different than what you're used to. Um, I wanna give a shout out for the first pamphlet we produced for caregivers, which um, was called Rewriting the Rule Book, which you can download um, online. And it has a lot of practical tips from me, from my um, caregiving talks I've done at our Victory Summits and what I've learned from myself or from other caregivers. And you've had a lot of that information today as well. 
And I think you all know, and I'm so proud of this, that we now have a Every Victory Counts um, pamphlet, thinner than the EVC for Parkinson's patients, but also wonderful for the care partner community. And I would encourage you to have your person with Parkinson's read this too, just as you can benefit greatly from knowing more about um, Parkinson's and your person with Parkinson's, you also want to be able to um, really, you know, stand there uh, fully informed on both sides of the equation because care partnering is a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. And so communication is key. I think you've heard that a few times today, but thoughtfulness between the two of you is also really important. Um, and that kind of thought, thoughtfulness and kindness is what will keep both you and your person with Parkinson's um, happy or happier, I hope. I know it's challenging and we're all in different places in terms of what challenges we're experiencing right now. But I know one thing when Davis was diagnosed, he was 40 years old. I was like, we're gonna be with this for a long time. It is a long journey. And my first little sketch on the um, far side of the, on the left side of your, your slide there is how I represent the journey up, down and all around. But um, the number one thing as an athlete, elite athlete who um, was an endurance athlete, I wanna say you have to pace yourself. And so that's not always possible because some of you are really in the thick of it and it feels like it's 24 seven. Um, but part of pacing yourself is also figuring out who you need to bring in to help you. That's so important. Um, the really super secret um, tip uh, and kind of unknown and unexplored part of an, an elite athlete's life, lifestyle is rest. And too often, especially, uh, I think most of you are older and, and many of you um, are um, retired. So you're not trying to work and balance care partnering, but some of you are, and this is, this is where it gets tough, right? Is, is when you're exhausted <laughs> and, or maybe you, the care partner has um, other health concerns, but your person with Parkinson's concerns are, are are put before yours. What you need to do, it's just like the stewardess tells you on the airplane is put your oxygen mask on first. And that number one thing might be just to get more rest. And whatever that means to you, whether it means having separate beds, whether it means sleeping in a different room, whether it means um, just having time to do your yoga practice or meditation practice without interruption. And to be honest, if you did the last two, the meditation and the yoga with your person with Parkinson's, it would be better for you and for them. But be a little, so the other thing about an elite athlete is that we're very good at knowing when we're too tired or too overworked and, and we'll rest. And I say we rest hard. It's Olympic level resting. So when you see those champions at the Olympics, when you saw them last summer, or when you see the winter Olympics this coming winter, you know what they do better than anything is they rest. So I want you to think about how you can rest more. Olympic athletes are also terrific at asking for help. They have coaches, physical therapists. They have a whole team around them. They have psychologists. And so who do you need to support you? Think about that. Who do you need to support you and think about your team, the people that are on your team that maybe aren't serving you as well now. Maybe it's time for them to move off the team and make room for someone else. So think about that from a very selfish standpoint, from your standpoint, you, the care partner. What do you need and who do you need? And line those people up and learn to ask them for help. Help in the kitchen, help with groceries, just coming to get your person with Parkinson's and to get them out for a walk or a, a regular exercise class, if that's possible. And coming to sit with your person with Parkinson's so you can go off on your own if you need um, that kind of support. So I also wrote down seek nourishment. You know, you, you don't race a two hour race without eating something and, you, and nourishing yourself, you know, having good food beforehand, having good food after, having good food during, um, 
nourishment. What form does it come in for you? I read a lot. I write a lot. And I do a lot of art. And I'm, I, that's nourishment for me. That's nourishment for me. What nourishes you? Um, optimism. I consider myself a um, incurable optimist. And you may not feel that way. And you don't have to be like full on optimistic about your person with Parkinson's lot in life or your lot in life. But the more you learn to see things through uh, a positive lens, the better it will be for you and your person with Parkinson's. And it, it's, probably, it's probably meant you've had to slow down. But you also need to understand that, you know, optimism is learned. You can learn it. It's not the same as um, toxic positivity, okay? Where you're just going to say, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Nothing's wrong. I'm good. That's not the point. The point is, is to know, to know how you are for sure. But, but um, if you're not doing really well, you have to take steps to help yourself. And it might be a medical intervention. It might be a friend intervention. It might be a weekend away, but in, in, um, as an elite athlete, um, burnout is, is a constant fear because if we, if we train too much, we get um, overtrained and the symptoms are of overtraining are very similar to the symptoms um, that you would feel as a, as a, if you, if you felt burned out, the number one thing that happens is you lose your sense of humor <laughs> and humor is so important too. I didn't put it on the list today, but I, I, as everybody knows, that's heard me talk before. I am a big fan of humor. And if you don't tell jokes, you can at least listen to them and maybe keep a little tickle notebook. We had a great talk about that um, on one of our recent, our mental health um, webinar uh, victory summit, which was really a great idea to just write down jokes, write down funny things, watch, you know, Comedy Central, get some humor in your life. But if you really don't find anything funny, then you probably are burned out. You're, you're languishing, not flourishing. And the best thing for that you can do for yourself is to figure out how to flourish, not languish. And many of us feel like we're languishing in this time of, um, uh, the pandemic. It's so difficult to not feel that. And the great uh, psychologist Esther Perel, who has uh, a number of podcasts, was talking about the time that we're living in, where we all feel because of COVID, and especially during the more tightly restricted times in COVID, how we're all feeling um, like we're in some enforced presence you know, the present tense of, of a present, right? And so she, and, and Davis and I were listening to this in the car and we literally stopped the recording to say, wow, you know what, enforced presence, that's Parkinson's. Because we don't know what it's gonna be like tomorrow. So we just had to focus on right now. And that's a good life lesson for anyone and for all of us. Sure, it's difficult. You don't know if you're gonna make it to, you know, your nephew's, wedding because a maybe it's not the right thing to do health wise b your person with parkinson's just might not be able to make it and so we have to stay flexible right and that's up there too you know and i always joke can you touch your toes that's not the kind of flexibly th flexibility of course we're talking about we're really trying to just keep our minds agile and go and kind of go with the flow but also be able to you know guard our best interests we need variety. We need connections. Um, up top, you'll see it says, uh, make connections, DIY, do it yourself or do it together. Do it together. Find support and do it together and make it, make it, you know, make your life a little bit easier just by having, you know, that little extra connection. And it doesn't mean you're not doing that with your person with Parkinson's. Davis and I do most things together. And we enjoy our time together, but I know that I have to be careful and I have to guard his energy more than I have to guard my own. Stay curious. There's nothing better in life than to be curious about something and, and keep learning. 
And so when you're listening to a podcast, a lot of times, like some of these podcasts are so good with Brene Brown, or, you know, I listen to the um, Dex Shepherd's podcast, and that leads me to all kinds of other um, podcasts. And I take notes when I listen to those, you know, I listen to Poetry Unbound, if you love poetry, the On Being um, channel has, uh, has this whole series uh, of podcasts that are just exquisite. Uh, featuring various poets and discussions around poetry, but what makes you happy? You know, what makes you happy? Um, find that, you know, happiness and joy, we've discussed that before too. And it's really, you know, you, you're, you're aiming as uh, John Paul Lederick said earlier, you're aiming for this moment of awe, daily moment of awe, right? Just something that takes you, takes your breath away. And I, I think we all live, everybody lives in a place where there are natural moments of awe every day. Most times in our house, it's the sunset. Um, let's look at the next slide real quick. Davis took this yesterday. Yesterday evening, uh, he races out to our deck because the sky is so beautiful and captures that. And that's almost a nightly occurrence for him. And then he likes to fuss around with those um, images and you know it just gives him a lot of pleasure uh, to um, you know crop and look at some of these. Um, so what what brings you joy? Is it a photograph? Is it um, is it a, a bike ride? Is it a walk in the park? Is it a nap? <laughs> you know, all activities are on the table. Can you go back one once? Um, yeah, and so, it, you know, I'm going to share um, also the notion to practice gratitude, and I want to add to that journaling, because when you write things down, whether you're taking notes from a podcast or an interesting documentary you might be watching or a book you're reading, you're really engaging in something that lifts you out of yourself, and when you practice gratitude, you're acknowledging that you have many things to be grateful for. Um, I'm usually pretty grateful just that I woke up in the morning. That just, just starts right there. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. I'm awake. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do this. So, you know, it, you can keep it simple. It could be a, a list of names. It could be events that happen in your past or that you hope will happen in the future. The fact that you're still planning your future is uh, something to be grateful for. So just take a look at what all those various, um, you know, factors are and, and spend some time with that in a journal. I love to journal. And most of the time I'm doodling, like drawing pictures and you know, just writing. And sometimes I refer back to them, sometimes I don't. Uh, I don't, but it's just important to write it down and get some of your hard feelings out of the way too. Some of the resentment, because that's a natural reaction to um, being confined by a person with Parkinson's, but it's also important to know that um, you can write it out. You can put it out there in the world where it's not going to hurt anybody. And uh, it might make you feel better. I think it will make you feel better. And um, a lot of my writing I've been doing recently has been about my childhood. And I just love sharing it with my three brothers. And I love when they um, send me thoughts back about things they remembered or how they remembered things. And uh, so you can time travel. You might not want to travel too much right now, but you can always time travel. And I do that a lot with um, my mind. I've traveled extensively. I've been very fortunate to have done that. And uh, a lot of times I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the Mediterranean Sea, a beautiful place. I might have sat and watched it's little things like that just can turn your mind um, to more positive feelings. And that's how you learn optimism if you don't already have it, is to daydream back into things that mean something to you. So let's go to the next slide. So yeah, a few action steps. Put yourself ahead of your person with Parkinson's on a regular basis so that you um, are healthy mentally and physically for them. Um, take time to exercise, of course, and, um, and, and keep making connections. Keep making connections, even if they're via Zoom. I know people say they're having fatigue from Zoom. I, I understand that if you're in the workplace and you're on Zoom all day, but it's a great way to connect with people. And I really encourage you to set up regular um, conversations with people. You know, I used to 
my mother used to call her her mother every Sunday. And so then I had to call her every Sunday. And, um, you know, just having that schedule is sometimes really, really helpful. Um, I think we've talked about the other points there. Let's go to the last slide. I'm going to try to get back on schedule a little bit here. Uh, I want to acknowledge that sometime being a care partner for someone with Parkinson's kind of feels like you're stuck in a dark tunnel. Um, this is a shot I took uh, of Davis riding through a tunnel in Grand Junction. Uh, we had gone back to visit um, and ride our bikes through an area that that we raced in uh, called the Tour of the Moon. It's just got fabulous rock formations. And I think this is kind of a nice metaphor of just kind of coming out into the, the daylight or coming out into something that you didn't remember was so beautiful. That, that was our experience there. Just coming out of, of, of this kind of darkness. Uh, and this was, you know, right, we actually went to get our vaccinations in Grand Junction because the Boulder ones were kind of backed up and I was like, let's go somewhere. <laughs> and so we drove out to the Western edge of our state took a couple bike rides and hikes and it was just such a relief not only to be vaccinated um, and feel like the world was opening up a little bit again but also to ride in this um, familiar place and revisit a memory that we both shared and uh, had really strong memories about so don't be afraid to do that you can always do that via your photos photo albums but you know take the time to remember what is great in your life and, um, and I think it will help you on so many levels, but as uh, one Olympian to another, because you're all Olympians in the field of uh, caregiving, what I wanna leave you with is this, you need to rest, you need to nourish yourself and you need to stay curious. And by staying curious, you'll stay open. And uh, in the words of my wonderful, um, the what not my wonderful but a wonderful zen teacher that i got to spend some time with um what we really want is a soft and open front and a strong back mm -hmm.